that brings two two ideas to my mind. One is that, uh, yeah, hopefully uh, in, in my specific brand of wizardry, say, um, it would be bringing light to the darkness of, of the dream world, like uh, trying to shine a light at relevant aspects that start to tell a story about what we're thinking about and telling ourselves as we're processing things in the background uh, unconsciously. Um, the other side of it is that uh, yeah, I immediately thought, basketball wizard, there are many kinds of wizards and I being a, um, sporting wizard is not my, not my strong suit. That would be, uh, you know, so a wizard isn't perfect. It's, it's not a God or demigod like position, just a human being with maybe unique special skills in a certain direction. They can uh, really display some kind of a, a talent, but there are basketball wizards, you know, and there are, um, my, my dad's a, an engineer designs towers and, you know, the kind of person that makes a train bridge carry the weight of the train across a, across a river. Um, I consider them mathematicians. That's a skill I don't have. <laughs> I cannot math. So. Good. I'll be the mind wizard then. <laughs> yeah, by that definition out oh, today for the purposes of our conversation, Absolutely. I'll be the mind wizard. Well, like you're saying, you're a, you're a wizard of possibility and transformation. Those are very powerful concepts too, because they, they are concepts and, and, you know, change over time is the thing that happens in the world. And, doing it intentionally, identifying paths forward is tremendous for folks that just can't see too well. You're shining a light in, in the darkness of people's potential as well. That's good stuff. You know, you know what I found, Benjamin, and this is going to be interesting. I think it is easier, at least in my world, to get a person who doesn't see the potential to see it than it is to take a person who is blinded by the limited potential. Mm to disassociate and release the addiction to what they think has to be, to oh. see what can be. It's really amazing. It really, really is amazing because I think the, the mindset poison that's so much out there is this phrase, this is the way, that's how it is. Mm. And the second we say that, the second we put ourselves into a prison of this is how it's got to be, that is the less spoken of and yet some of the most poisonous walls of mind imprisonment that I've seen, you know, and that, that that's an interesting kind of concept to look at. For sure. It, it, the immediate association I had was with the idea of, uh, or the Buddhist concept of suffering, the idea that mm -hmm. uh, a lot of what mm -hmm. we, a lot of suffering is, is um, the disconnect between our desires and what is possible actually, or what Detachment. is. Yeah, attachment to these to these things, specific outcomes. Um, I'll only be happy if I get X, Y, and Z. Maybe not, but I mean, if you if you don't end up with X, Y, and Z, and you've told yourself you can't be happy without it, you will be unhappy. So maybe you can find happy happiness with ABC instead, if you let go of that attachment. Yeah. That's just it. So a person who's unaware, this is, you know, where they say ignorance is bliss. Well, yeah, it's not, but yeah, it is. Because when you're <laughs> unaware, you're unaware. When you're unaware of something better, you are unaware. And so you are in this apathetic state of stillness and peace and joy. The second you become aware, you become agitated. And so it's all about making that gap of, you know, yeah, I want to match my potential continually. And how do I stay grateful and growing without becoming content or agitated. So that's the balance of all of these wizardly things of mind that we do. For sure. <laughs> yeah. And then and the, the thought that was inspired by that idea is this um, comparison we do that seems to have become worse on in the social media age. We look at the best parts version, the staged manufactured crafted image someone places out there of how of perfection. And we go, I can't. I can't achieve that or, or, or that gap between what we think we should be doing and where we are, that gap becomes full of that suffering and that agitation, as you were saying. Love it. I love that analogy. You know, I, I actually, uh, quite a few months back, I have this, um, I have an online subscription group for people that are into energy work and conscious subconscious stuff, you know, like junkie <laughs> and it's called quantum freedom because we're looking to that. And I did an amazing program where we looked at, what you're describing as appearance and substance mm. and that gap between appearance and substance. But then uh, what I was shown was really cool is that in our bio, I, I believe our biology is a form of our spirituality. It's just my little world. 
And so what I was shown is that just like our DNA is the substance of who we are physically, our RNA is the appearance of that. And if you think of the power that when they are not reflecting back to each other, the disease is born. And so it's not that appearance is wrong. It's just that when, when you appear to be something or someone you're not, you're crushing, you're, dis- you're, you're exposing your spiritual self, your energy to the same disease, you know, your, or anyway, so that, that's, um, that's kind of what that, what that triggers for me, you know, um, of being consistent with your appearance and your substance as your substance grows and expands, have your appearance come with it. But the second you send your appearance as a messenger of something you're not, you're, you're going back into that misery, into that gap of, you know, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think it is, it is very important that, uh, too many people think they have to put on an appearance and it's complicated with, a. Uh, social stuff. There's uh, like, so for me, we were talking about, I got the autism thing. And for me to be honest, I would have to say, I prefer to be alone 99% of the time. I, I, I say it like this. I say, um, I would like to be invited to your birthday party because the expression that you wish me to be there, it means something to me. I feel it. I am not coming. I do not mm-hmm. care for those social circumstances. No offense to you, but that's, there's that social disconnect with me too. It's like, well, Ben's the guy that never shows up to my party. Does he really care? I do care. I just care from over here. I just, I can't okay. do the social thing. That's not my, that's not my thing. So, you know, so there's that disconnect in a way of like, there's this expectation of certain social rituals, perhaps that, uh, um, I was going somewhere with that, you know, that I could put on as a facade, but that feels disingenuous to me. So it's one of those things where I'm like, I was going to be me. I'm going to do my thing. And you, you know, hopefully you understand and if you don't, I, I honestly, I'm not going to change anything because it's not, it's not my thing. <laughs> so, Love that. Yeah. Well, just that honesty. Well, that's something too, that I think, um, and it's tough. I was listening the other day and there's, you know, anything to, to, too much of an extreme can be a problem. So radical honesty when this one guy tried to, a, a researcher tried to live his life by radical honesty and just destroyed every relationship he ever had because he said exactly what he thought all the time without a filter that fair enough. That was his results. Maybe he just had a lot of negative things to say and people didn't care for it and other people might have different results, but the other side of, you know, uh, radical compassion too, too much becomes enabling, you know, there's, there's, like, I'm always looking for that yin yang balance of, of, of opposites. And it's not always directly in the middle. Sometimes it's a little more to one side or the other, um, but we can't become too extreme. We get out of balance. Yeah. In any direction. I was going I think, somewhere with all that. I think, yeah, no, I think it happens. I think it happens for all of us when we mistake our way for the way and we mistake our honesty for the honesty and our compassion for the compassion. And as yeah. long as we're very comfortable understanding that, what we think is honest could be a lie that is crafted through our judgment and limitation. Yeah. Then it really makes us all pause. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's so, this, this is, this is, I just had this um, session with my annual client and we were talking about being guided and being right, right? Because that they're not the same thing. That very often you will get an intuitive answer and you will follow that answer only to come to a dead end Mm. and then go into the crisis of faith and go like, wait a minute, I knew I was guided. How come it's a wall? And to understand that that is intentional is a point of freedom. Mm. And the example I use is that, you know, if you and I, Benjamin and Vika are in the Jeep going through the jungle, a nightmare for both of us, by the way, (laughs) a Mm -hmm. complete nightmare, but we're going through the jungle, right? In Amazon. And all of a sudden we come to a dead end and we both, whatever skills we have to tune in to the guidance, we say, we feel we should go right. So we turn right at that, de- at the, not the dead end, the fork, the left and the right. And we go right. We drive right for about five minutes only to come, I don't know, Canyon, whatever we come to, it's the dead end. So we turn around in hesitation going like, wait a minute, we were guided. We know we were guided. And we get back on that left side of the road, and now we stay on it hour after hour, 
and only six, seven, eight hours into it, we understand the brilliance of divine guidance. Because having come to the dead end, we never question that we are on the right path. Mm. Yeah. So be, being guided will slap us against the wall so many times. And to turn around real quick and say, ooh, thank you for the dead end. What was that other fork in the road? Yeah. yeah. A lot of our um, suffering, speaking of that, comes from, yeah, these expectations that I shouldn't have hit a dead end. I made a mistake and that was a bad thing. Uh, I, what was the very famous quote? The guy says, I learn more from failure than I do from success. Cause if you, you know, if, if you get it right, was it an accident? But if you get it wrong, you can look at it and go, Oh, well, I know why that went wrong. It's, it's a lot easier to kind of identify. Now that doesn't mean you should aim for all the wrong answers first to learn best necessarily, but not to beat yourself up too much about, uh, you know, it, this inspired me as well. The idea of, um, being guided. And I, I try to be very careful with people about the dream situation. So, um, and it comes down to the idea of, of uh, as, as some of the books, uh, speaking of which, my historical dream literature, uh, a lot of these books I'm reading talk about the idea of morality in dreams and how we should look at things like, this is a go-to example for me, um, you dream, you stab your dog. In waking life, you love that animal more than life itself. You would never do anything to harm them. The dream is not telling you, oh, you have a secret wish to harm your dog. No. There's, there's something else going on there. Um, so I, I try to caution people not to look at their dreams as this is what you should do, or this is a prophecy for you, or this is your secret desire. You should follow it. But more like, here's what you were thinking about while you were asleep. Here's how you played out this imaginary. Like we do it when we're awake. We go, I wonder if I call this girl, if she'll be home. I wonder if I say, hey, how you doing? She'll think that's a great intro. I wonder if I should ask her to these we play out these different scenarios in our head of like, what if I do this? What if I do that? And in that process, we kind of figure out, here's what I feel most comfortable doing, most genuine for me, and what I think is most like, likely to succeed. Um, so there's, you know, it's make, we just call it making plans. But we, but we daydream in our head that we play out these scenarios. We even see it happen. Um, and we do the same thing when we're asleep. So I'm like, don't take it as a, guidance necessarily but to focus your attention on what you were processing during that time to understand what you were thinking more clearly so that's, that's my rant yeah <laughs> so. I, I love that you know I